All right, y'all ready for the word? Second Thessalonians. We're going to start the book of Second Thessalonians today. We just finished up First Thessalonians, and uh, boy, I tell you, that's a, a, a great, great song to end there with. Do you know Jesus loves you? I, I mean, how I many of you grew up singing that? We used to sing it all the time. Don't hear it as much anymore, but it's such a, such a powerful truth. Seems like that's a theme for the past few days for me, and even in this message today, is uh, an unconditional love. Do you understand unconditional love? I hadn't even, I mean, you know me, I don't give titles to sermons and all of that, but if I did, I think that's what's on my heart this morning is, what is an unconditional love? You know, what are your expectations? Well, as we begin the book of Second Thessalonians, let me take you back and tell you how this church got started. We can read about it in Acts chapter 17. You can follow with me on the screen there. We'll read a few verses here about the, uh, how Paul started the church at Thessalonica, which is in uh, Greece there. So now when they had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. And some of them are persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. And attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also, and Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things, and when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. And of course you know they had to sneak Paul and Silas out you know, at night, and they went off to Berea. So we know here that Paul started this church at Thessalonica. And we know that in the beginning, it was some of the Jews that stayed with him. Some of the Jews believed, and a large number of the God-fearing Greeks. So that means, uh, when, when you hear the term God-fearers, we read that in like, uh, we studied about the Corinthians. Uh, and you'll see about the uh, Cornelius was a God-fearer, the Bible says. What does that mean? A God-fearer was a Gentile who was turning to Judaism. That's what a God-fearer was, okay? They weren't a born-again Christian. They hadn't believed in Christ. They didn't know the gospel. What happened here is these Gentiles, these Greeks, who were turning to Judaism, believing in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so they were following along with the Jews, and they could join into Judaism. They made them do all kinds of things to join in, right? But they were God-fearers. But then when Paul comes in and preaches about Christ, the Messiah, they believe. And so they were added to the church. And so that's what it meant by God-fearing Greeks. Um, these Christians at Thessalonica, Paul was only with them for three weeks, three, you know, three Sabbath days. And they were suffering, as we see in the very beginning. The Jews stirring up all the people, you know, hey, we got to stop the spread of this these men are coming in here saying there's another king besides Caesar, and it's Jesus, and we got to stop it. You know, and so that was, of course, the ongoing problem. And you know what? It's still a problem today. I, that's a neat little video Pat pulled up today. Who's king of your life? We like to say Jesus is king, but really? When Jesus says, go here, go do this, go do that, I want you to do this, do you say, eh, I'm good? See, a king doesn't give suggestions, does he? A king doesn't tell his people in his, in his kingdom, I really hope that you'll do this for me. A king gives what? Command. A king has authority over you. Do you believe Jesus Christ is your Lord? Lord means authority over. It means when he, like my daddy said, when I say jump, you just say how high. You know, we're here to obey. We're here to serve. And that is a big problem that we're seeing in a lot of, uh, in our country today. And we'll talk about it some today. A lot of people believe in Jesus, but he says, I will tell them, I never knew you. Depart from me. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. 
I was telling the men, I keep getting called for these funerals in our community, and they have no church affiliation. It, it's happening more and more. I was talking to some pastors just yesterday about it, you know, and um, and I keep wanting to say, why do you, why do you all of a sudden want a, a preacher? You know, you know. But here's the thing: instead of me being mean to them, I'm not here to be mean to them. I look forward to an opportunity to me to walk into that funeral home down there and whatever audience is there, they're going to hear the gospel that day. They may take stones and throw at me. They may run me out of there. I really don't care. But they're going to hear the gospel. And that's what all of us should be desiring, right? That's what Paul was doing when he comes into Thessalonica. He wasn't worried about the threats. He wasn't worried about all these things that man could do to him. What was he worried about? Obeying his Lord, preaching the gospel. And he set up this church. And even these people were suffering. And so, Paul, is, we've already studied 1 Thessalonians. They had some questions. Paul writes back and explains to them and answers a lot of their questions. And now, apparently, they have some more questions. They have a, you know, it's always going to happen in the church. There's always going to be, some people in here this morning know a lot of things about the Bible, and some people in here don't know very much. You know what, and, I, and, and Wade and I talk about it often, it's we're always having to start back over. I've been through all of the major doctrines of the Bible and studied them to the nth degree, but you, somebody new comes in, I've got to be willing to go right back where he's at. Well, what do you mean Jesus is God? Okay, let me explain that to you. You know, well, how, does, how do you know the Bible is, is uh, infallible and inerrant? Okay, let me explain that to you. You know, so you've got to be willing to go back over and start with people. That's why I'm, we, we put a plug in for our Celebrate Recovery. If you really want to be a disciple maker, God has given us an opportunity right here to come in and meet a stranger and say, hey man, because let me tell you how discipleship works, church. It works mostly on the phone through the week, talking to people. When you're driving home, instead of listening to the radio, instead of listening to talk radio about all that's jacked up out in the world that you can't fix, turn that junk off, talk to someone about Christ, answer their questions, go through the doctrines with them. Get to know strangers and do that. I'm telling you, you will never regret that. That's what's happening here. Paul went to strangers, and he started this church, and they're asking questions. And so he's going to write back to them again. And here he says in verse 1, Paul and Silvanus. Now, Paul and Silvanus, those are, right off the bat, let me explain something to you. That's their Roman names. Paul had a Jewish name, Saul, okay? He didn't change his name to Paul. His name was always Paul, just like Sylvanus' name was always Sylvanus. But his Jewish name is Silas. Y'all remember hearing the story of Paul and Silas, right? So it just because he's in Corinth writing and he chooses to use their Roman names, and we see this often, Paul always describes himself as Paul, not as Saul. Uh, Saul brought back a lot of bad memories to him, I think. When you, <laughs> you know, living as a Judaizer and persecuting the church of Christ, so I think he was content to be just, I'm Paul, you know, and that's, I'm sure uh, that's probably what we'll call him in heaven maybe, I don't know. But he says, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy, Timothy obviously keeps his name, he was a Greek, his mother was a Jew, but he kept, his father was a Greek, so he, he keeps the same name all the way through. And it says here, to the church of the Thessalonians, uh, Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we know who's writing, and we know who the letter's written to. He's saying, to the church. That's who he's writing to. To the church. What is the church? The called out ones. The ecclesia, right? The, that means the people, the, I, I've described to you guys that, that, that the whole world is born with the sin of Adam because we're in Adam. And when we're born, meaning what? We're in sin. Adam represents sin, right? He fell. Sin was put on Adam. Therefore, because we're descendants of Adam, we're born with Adam's sin. So that's what it means that we're in Adam, all right? So when we're in Adam, we're dead to God. We're dead to spiritual things. We cannot come into God's presence. No human being on the planet can enter into heaven. Why? Because he's a sinner. So we can't go into heaven. No sin will enter into heaven. The only way you can go into heaven is you must be perfect, sinless. That's the only way you get to go into heaven. So we're in Adam, but when God, when the Lord Jesus Christ, by His grace, borns you again, when He gives you new life, He calls you out of darkness, 
He takes away the heart of stone and gives you a heart of flesh. When He makes you His own, then He places you into the body of Christ called the church. So that's who He's writing to. Those who have been born again to the church. And specifically, He's writing to the little church that's gathered at this geographical place called Thessalonica. And so He's writing to them. But obviously there will be millions and millions more who will read this letter just like you and I are reading it today 2,000 years later. And there's going to be many people read this letter who are not in the church. Okay? Many people will sit in the congregations each week that are not the church. And I want you to understand that. There, and I hope not, but there may be someone in here this morning or someone here that's listening in, you know, uh, online that you're listening you're sitting here, you're in a chair, but you're not in the church yet. You've come to the foot of the cross. You've heard about Jesus. You've heard about the Holy Spirit. You've heard about the Bible. You see these things. You see the love of people, but you've not committed your life to Christ. You've not believed in a, sal in a, uh, a salvation that is an eternal salvation. You're still probably wanting to hang on to this world. You're like, the, like we're studying on Sunday nights and on Wednesday nights. The children of Israel thought that they could praise Yahweh, serve Yahweh, love Yahweh, and the God, the Canaanite gods at the same time. You can't. Jesus makes it clear. You cannot serve two masters. You will love the one and hate the other. So if you love this world, the things of this world, that the things that this world has to offer you are more exciting to you, then you've already, like I said in the video, you've already made your choice. That's who you love. You will not, then therefore, because you love the things of this world, you will hate Christ. And you're like, no, I don't hate Jesus. Jesus said, if you're not with me, you're what? Against me. And I'm going to make a comment about that, what that means here in just a minute. So hang on to that thought. He says here, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians, in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He's making it clear to us that this is not a Jewish assembly, okay? Because he adds the name Jesus in there. Well, I was talking to you earlier about this prayer going out, you know, for this football player all over the world. Everybody's kneeling and praying. You got all kinds of people who hate Jesus, but they're praying. Praying to what? They're praying to nothing. They're wasting their air. You're good. Hey, and, and I don't want anybody in this church to ever again write on Facebook, I'm sending you good vibes. If you've done that, I don't know if you've done it. I, I'm not picking on you. But what you're doing when you do that is you're trying to hold hands with the world. You're trying to show the world, you know what, I love you. The church don't love you, but I do. No, you're not. You're not doing any good. You're not helping anybody. What, what helps them is to say, no, I don't believe in good vibes. That don't mean nothing. I believe in praying to the one true God of the Bible. And it says in Acts 4.10, let me tell you about this Jesus. Paul stood up, I mean, Peter stood up that day. He was brave and bold. He could have got him killed. And he said, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this man, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. And I pray to God that that young man, whoever he is, that football player, because I saw a cross on his face, on a picture, I pray that when he comes to and he gets to talk, that that's the name that he exalts. That he stands up and makes it clear, no, we don't serve the God of Islam or the God of Buddha or the God of the Hindu. Those are fake gods. Those are Satan's things. We're not of that. We're only of the God of the 66 books of the Bible. And he says here, this Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Buddha didn't get raised from the dead. Confucius didn't get raised from the dead. None of them got raised from the dead. Only Jesus Christ got raised from the dead. By this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And watch, church, young people, listen to this. Don't let anybody ever confuse you. Watch the end of this verse. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved saved no other name Jesus made it clear in John 14 I am the way the truth and the life and no one comes to the father but by me 
So do not be ashamed, church, to name the name of Jesus. If you're going to pray for somebody, you tell them, I'm praying to Jesus. I ain't praying to just any... Because, you know, people in the world, they're okay if you talk about God, right? But as soon as you name the name of Jesus, what, is, what do people do? Oh, boy. And maybe you've done that before. Maybe you feel more comfortable talking about God, but if I bring up Jesus, I know my friend, oh, well, you're a, you're a, you're one of them fundamentalist Christians, you know, you, you, you just believe that, you think, you hate everybody. You just hate. You just hate everybody. I believe love is love. Let people love who they want to love. And you know what? I believe God is love, and we ought to obey Him. Let God be true and every man a liar. And He says here that they are in Christ, right? In God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, it says, Timothy and Silvanus Silas are with him still. Everybody in this church knew who those two men were. He had already sent them back. So they've had several interactions with uh, Timothy and Silas. So they knew them. And this second letter comes a few months after the first letter because we know that Paul was still in Corinth with Timothy and Silvanus. Acts 18 11 tells us that Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half. So what he does, he gets to, you know, once he leaves Thessalonica, goes to Bria, and then he goes down, uh, Corinth is in the southern part of the, of the country over there, down along the coast. So he's down there, and he stays for 18 months. Remember Aqu Aquila and Priscilla? He stays there with them, tent makers, and he writes these letters. He wrote, uh, this is the third letter that Paul writes in his order, okay? His first book that Paul wrote was Galatians. Then he writes 1 Thessalonians, then he writes 2 Thessalonians, Okay? We know that this is uh, somewhere between 51, the fall of 51 to the spring of 52 A.D., somewhere in that timeline is when Paul writes 2 Thessalonians and 1 Thessalonians, okay? And one of the main things that we're going to see in, this, in these three chapters in, in 2 Thessalonians uh, is that because the apostle was not with them, there to answer their questions every single day with everybody in the congregation, Men begin to speculate on things. Have you men ever begin to speculate on things? Wives, you ever speculate? Well, what about this? What you know how we do? Now you think, okay, if you got a question tomorrow morning, if all of you, you know, had a question tomorrow morning about the sermon, and you say, I'm gonna call Derek and ask him. Nine o'clock in the morning, I'm gonna call Derek. Who am I gonna get? How am I supposed to answer all of you? Right? So the apostle wasn't there. And men begin to speculate. And so they've got these questions that comes up. And they think maybe this or maybe that. And this is why I stress to you so much, if you please hear me on this. When you're having discussions with people, be biblical. Always be biblical. People are going to challenge you about a lot of things. And I'm like, you know what? I, that does sound, that sounds good, but it's not biblical. Well, why this? Well, let me, I, look, ma'am, sir, I can't really explain all that to you and be biblical, right? How do I describe to people the sovereignty of God who is over all things, who causes all things, and the responsibility of man? I can't and be biblical. I can't harmonize that paradox for you. There's a lot of things I can't tell you. I often will take people to Deuteronomy where it says the secret things belong to the Lord. I don't know. So I want you to make sure when you're answering people's questions that you're biblical. Don't go with your gut. Like I told you last, don't go with your heart. Your heart's wicked. Right? We're in the flesh still. So don't go with that. Don't go. Don't lean on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge Him and how do we know what He wants? In His Word. So be biblical. So verse 2, He says, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. See what he's done here twice, guys? He's, he's put God and Jesus right there together. Make sure you understand. We went through this back at Christmas time. Jesus is God. But be clear, we're not modalists here. T.D. Jakes and all the oneness Pentecostals, that's heresy. The, the, the God doesn't just become Jesus at times and then become the Holy Spirit at times and then he's God at times. Jesus is not the Father and the Father is not the Son. Okay? They are three distinct persons, but one true God. That is very important that we understand who God is. See, we have to be biblical. When you, as soon as you get away from Scripture, you get in trouble. 
I'm telling you, I've seen it over and over and over. I spend every single week talking with people. I could show you my Facebook messenger, you know, all over this community. People are like, man, you said this, but I don't understand that. And I'm, I love those conversations. That's why I encourage people to message me. And I'm like, no, the Bible doesn't say that. That's not what the Bible says. No, that's not what that means. You're out of context there. Let me, let's go back to the beginning of the chapter and let's read the full context to make sure that we're biblical. Because if you're not biblical, then you're contradicting Scripture. And when you contradict Scripture, guess what? They think your Jesus is a liar. So make sure that you're biblical. He says, grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul uses this standard greeting in all 13 of his letters. And I wanted to be clear here today. The only reason that you are getting this letter, and I'm getting this letter, is because of the grace of God. The only reason you even care to read this letter and obey it is because of the grace of God. And when you receive the grace of God, there is always, going to be the peace of God. Do you understand that? When you get the grace of God, you get the peace of God. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. You got it. It's there. You cannot know the peace from God without the grace of God. Get that. I think I'll say it again. I didn't get enough amens. You can't know the peace from God without the grace of God. If you don't have the peace from God, then you don't have peace with God. And if you don't have peace with God, then guess what? His wrath still abides on you, and you are still enemies of God because of sin. And you can't do anything about your sin. And if you don't confess Jesus as Lord and turn from your sin and follow him, you will die in your sin, and no sinner can enter into heaven. As I said earlier, you must be perfect to enter into heaven. So now you know why Paul starts off all 13 of his letters by the grace of God. For it's by grace that you've been saved, not by any human works. Not because you were good, not because you were better than Ted Bundy or Jeffrey Dahmer, or that, you know, wicked girl down the street. That had nothing to do with it. It's only by the grace of God. Nothing matters more than grace. I was thinking about that yesterday, playing with my little niece, and I was thinking about the sermon today, and, and that note that I put in my message there, you know, about nothing matters more than grace, and her middle name is Grace. And I just said, thank you, Lord, that she's got parents that wanted to put the name Grace, that wanted to name her Grace, Adley Grace. What a beautiful name, huh? She's beautiful. She loves Uncle Derek more than anybody. That's by the grace of God. Yeah. Paul also makes sure to say it is from God and the Lord Jesus Christ, as I told you earlier. He puts them together, rightly so. He wants them to understand God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is Jesus. He became flesh. God became flesh and dwelt among us. What's that big fancy word? Incarnation. Remember that? God became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld him as the only begotten Son of God. Verse 3 says, We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is only fitting, because your faith is greatly enlarged, and the love of each one of you toward one another grows even greater. You know what I noticed here? As Paul's writing to this little church, imagine he's writing to Unity Baptist Church here in National City. And he says, We should always give thanks to God for you guys. Why? It's only fitting because your faith is greatly enlarged. And the love of each one of you toward one another grows even greater. Wouldn't you love to hear God write to this church and say that? Boy, I'm so proud of you guys at Unity Baptist Church. Paul doesn't talk here about their numbers. He doesn't write and say, boy, y'all have done a really good job getting big numbers in your church. He doesn't. He doesn't write about the size of their building. He doesn't compliment them on the amount of money that they've taken up. What he writes to them about is their faith and their love. I always think of faith, hope, and love, right? So important. Church, we're nothing without faith and love. Nothing. You might, you're, just, you're just warm bodies sitting in here just waiting for the time to pass. And people will come in and they will notice if you have no love for people. They, they're not, they're not going to care what you think or what you believe or what you know. 
What they're going to care is, did you love them? And that bothers me about the church. It would bother me if we got a letter written to us from God and said, Derek, I see, you know, because I'm telling you, I'm trying out here to reach this community. I'm trying all I can to talk to people, to get involved in families. And if they come up and say, well, Derek, I did come down there, but these people just ain't very loving. That would break my heart. What, why would you not be loving? <laughs> I'm not asking you to stand up here and preach a sermon to explain all the hard doctrines of the Bible, Emma. I'm just asking you to love people. That's simple. And Paul's bragging on them because of their faith and their love. He says their faith is greatly enlarged. Do you know how your faith grows? First of all, you've got to ask the question, do you want your faith to grow? Do you want to be strengthened in your faith? If you're thinking, well, I'm not sure, you wait till a tragedy happens in your life. That's when you lean on that faith. I promise you, I don't care who you are, what your past life experience is or where you grew up at or how you grew up. When you reach that point where you don't know what else to do, you'll lean on the faith, on your faith. And you'll lean on the promises of God. And guess what it'll do? It'll get you through it. It'll comfort you. It'll set you free. Remember the Bible says truth will set you free. And their faith was greatly enlarged. So you've got to ask your question, should do you want your faith to strengthen? You should. And let me tell you why you should. Hebrews 11.6 says, And without faith, it is impossible to please Him. Now you want your faith to grow? Because without faith, you can't please God. Do you want to please God? If you don't want to please God, you might as well go home. Good luck to you, because I already know what's coming for you. A vapor of a life and eternity in hell. But if you really want to please God, you, you're... Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he comes to God, for he who comes to God, watch this church, must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. How many of you have ever received a reward from God? Hey, every hand should go up. You're sitting here this morning. There's a reward from God. He could have left you blinded in your sin, dead in your trespasses and sin. In Romans 10, 17, it says, So faith, you want stronger faith? Here's where it comes. Faith comes from hearing and hearing by the words of Christ. Literally the words of Jesus. Where are they at? Let me tell you something. Be very careful here, church. You do not get the words of God by feeling them. You can't close your eyes and wait and see what God gives you and then write it down. You only get the word of God from the Word of God. There will be no other revelations given to you. If anybody stands up and tells you they got a revelation from God, they're lying. Or the Bible's lying. The revelations we get are from this. The Holy Spirit will only lead you according to the truth, the Bible says, right? He will only lead you according to what God has already written. You don't get something that other, other Christians don't get. You can't just meditate and pray to some God that you hope is out there. The Bible says you must believe in Him and there's definitely no reason not to. We've been talking about that on our Old Testament study. Goodness gracious, guys. Go back. We're almost 7,000 years since creation. What has God not shown you? He's proven Himself. I say it so many times to stress to you guys. 66 books in this Bible written by 40 different men and they never contradict each other. Saturday, December 14th, so what's today's date? So help Josh and me remember, hey, the batteries last only so long. Of course, I don't know how long that they, that they talked on Celebrate Recovery Friday night. They used that one. That might have been our, our mate. But anyway, 
So we must have strong faith, church. That needs to be important to you. You should desire a stronger faith. And you can't get that by just hoping for it or meditating for it or feeling it or loving it. It don't just come like that. And I promise you, because I've fallen asleep, it don't come with that either. you got to literally read it. And that's why the church is such a gift, right? Because if you, because I guarantee you, you're going to read it. So I don't understand that. Me neither. But guess what? When we come together and we really look into it, I've kind of studied a little bit ahead of you. That's why God gives you these pastors, right, to help you. You know, so generally I can help you with a lot of it. If I can't, then I'll call somebody smarter than me. But I promise you we'll get you answers, okay? But there's no way a person can say, that they love Jesus with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And to tell people, I've been born again. I've been made into a whole new creation. But I don't want to know Jesus more and more. That's not possible. That's not possible. When you know Him, trust me, you're going to want more and more of Him. That's what I've seen in my life. When I truly knew who Christ was, I wanted more and more. I just want to I want to find out more and more about him. Even this morning, waking up thinking about his face. I just want to see his face so bad. I want to look at Jesus. You know, and I want to hug him. And I just want to talk to him. And I want to tell him how sorry I am for the stupid stuff I did. And then I want to say, like I've been watching this Chosen series, and I was a little apprehensive about it, but I'm kind of glad I watched it because, man, to see Mary look up, I mean, she wouldn't even look at him. He said, Mary, look at me. Look at me. Boy, I was in tears already. <laughs> I was in tears already. I can't look at you, Lord. He says, yes, you can. Look at me. I forgive you. I forgive you. Church, do you understand the forgiveness of God? Wow. If you do, if you know the love of Jesus, you know the forgiveness of God, then you're going to want to know it more and more and more. And he says also here, besides your faith growing, another thing he noticed about this little church was their love for one another that it has grown greater and greater. See, that's all, that's all that can happen when you get born again. You know why? Because the love of Christ has been shed abroad in our hearts. Don't tell me you don't love people. Don't tell me that. I bet you tell you, I have a hard time loving. I get that, right? Because we're all in the flesh. I can tell you right now, I bite my tongue a lot of times. But when I go back and remember what I've done to the Lord, who am I to cast judgment upon them right I know I love the old saying I'm just a beggar showing other beggars where I found food that's all I am how can you I want y'all to get this right here because I think this is what happens in the church a lot of times I think a lot of Christians well-meaning Christians they try to force people to be what they want them to be I think we've all done it I've done it you've done it we try to force things on people we try to demand things, right? We live in a time, my rights, my rights, right? We try to demand things from people. But we're not supposed to force people to be what we want them to be for us, okay? And, and pe good, well-meaning people do marriages. Does that not happen in a marriage all the time? Trying to force the other person to be what you want them to be? And what you do there, see, you put expectations on people. And when they don't meet your expectations, then what do you do with that? What do we hear in the world today? Well, I don't love him anymore. I don't love her anymore. Let me tell you something. How can you ever in your life know what unconditional love means if you only love the people who meet your expectations? I don't love everything about my wife. Oh. Because I want you, y'all don't know this, and, and, and I probably shouldn't say it, but since I've done started down this road, yeah, it's going to be my last day preaching. But uh, my wife is not glorified yet. And I'm not glorified yet. You know, she and I talk about this often, and I was telling uh, Dusty and Mandy in their wedding too, and, uh, and I've told others, is uh, talk about an 
ungodly marriages versus Christian marriage. Talk about that often in your marriage. She and I have learned to do that about how we used to think and how we think now. And, and a big one that come up is so true is these expectations of each other. If I expect her to be perfect in everything, then guess what? She's never going to meet my condition. And I'll never really have an uncon... So it's good sometimes that, that she lets me down. And it's good sometimes that I let her down because that helps us learn, you know what? I love her anyway. I love her in spite of her weaknesses. But if I'd have never known the love of Christ, if I'd never truly understood the love of Christ, I'd never know how to love that woman. I couldn't have done it. I couldn't have done it. First time she picked up my cup and made me mad, you know, I, you know. Some of y'all know the little inside story on that one. So, how can you ever know an unconditional love if you only love people who meet your expectations? You've got to learn to love the unlovable. Because I promise you, you were unlovable to Jesus, but he loved you. He loved you enough to take his cross, take your cross to Calvary and die for you. While you were yet sinners, Christ died. For you. He didn't wait for you to get it right and then die for you, did he? He died for you while you were still a slave to sin. In verse 4, Therefore, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. So he's saying because of the grace of God giving you the faith to believe in Jesus, first off, first and foremost, the only reason you believe in Jesus is because of the gift of faith, right, that he's given you by his grace. See, it's by grace through faith, which is the gift of God. The Bible says it. I don't know how Christians get that goofed up. That faith is the gift of God. So because of the grace of God giving you the faith to believe in Jesus as the only way to heaven, no other name given to men under heaven there whereby we must be saved remember that thereby, thereby giving you this new life placing you into this body of christ now that you're in christ you're no longer in adam anymore the church is where you belong and seeing you grow in your faith he's seeing them grow in their faith why because they're seeking to know him more and more they're not like the lady i told you that that the preacher hid his spoon in her bible and she couldn't find her spoon anywhere so she finally confronts him. Where's my spoon? Did you take my spoon? No, ma'am, I put it in your Bible. Because she wasn't seeking to know God, right? She was trying to impress the preacher. Seek to know God. When you do that, your faith is going to grow. So because your faith is growing, because of all of these things, because of the obvious love that you have for the church, we can speak proudly of you. How would you like to hear that? Not just you individually, but the church. Collectively, Unity Baptist Church. Wouldn't you love to say, I love your church? I never forget this lady years ago when we were, we were already in this building. She come to me afterwards and she goes up to First Baptist. And uh, I know her sister real well, but I didn't know her that well. But she come to me and you know how little old ladies will take your hand like that and rub your hand. And she said, I just want you to know I love your little church. I feel like I'm back in the 70s again. Back when she was really first coming into the church. You know? And I thought that was great. To hear somebody that saw the love in this church. But I've had others say they didn't see the love in the church. So you know what? It's a back and forth. But you know what? We can all do better, I'm sure. But you should care what this community thinks of you. Now, remember I told you this a couple of weeks ago. In case you ever think. And hear me on this. I'm closing. I've only got a few lines. I don't care what people think of me. If that ever crosses your mind, listen to me clearly here. Don't say that anymore. Today, you're done. Don't say that anymore as a Christian. Don't ever say, I don't care what other people think of me. You know why I'm telling you that? Because your life is not your own anymore. You were bought with the precious blood of Christ. And now, I don't live anymore, but Christ liveth in you. You represent Jesus Christ. And I want you to know something. He definitely cares what people think of you. And I definitely care what other people think of my Jesus. If you're out misrepresenting Jesus, it makes me upset. 
how would you feel, men, if somebody's out there lying about your wife in this community? I know you men. You're good, ardent, patriot men, tough guys. Somebody's lying about your wife, you're ready to ring their bell, ain't you? Well, how about if somebody in this church is misrepresenting Jesus? Does that break your heart too? Now, don't hear me wrong, guys. We don't get to punch people. Some of you is like, oh, yeah, man, I like this preacher. The church should care what the community thinks of the church. We want people to know that they can, when they come into the church, maybe for the first time in their life, they can experience a true, unconditional love when they come in here. And each of us have a part to play in doing that. That's what I want people to know. I want them to know an unconditional love. And I also want you guys, it's not just my job, guys. It's not just my job to greet the, the visitors. It's not, just my, it's not my job to just go out and, and to make disciples in the community. It's the church's job. See, that's why people get confused about the church. The church is a gathering of the body of believers. That's what this is happening on the Lord's Day. This is not an evan evangelical crusade out in the streets trying to reach the lost, right? We're equipping the saints. That's what we gather as the church to do. Now, in my messages, what's unique about me in Unity Baptist Church is I always thread a little evangelism in. We're expository preaching. We're giving you the whole counsel of God. We're trying to make sure you understand what the Bible says. We're a Bible-teaching church, but we're very evangelical at the same time. Got me? So I'm always trying to make sure... That you, that you bring your friends and family in here, they're going to hear the gospel. You've already heard it today. Remember when I said you cannot enter into heaven because of sin? They need to hear that. No. And let me tell you something. It's breaking my heart, but it's saying way too much on the Internet. All these people going around, somebody dies, and they're saying, well, give heaven some hell because of a country song. Guys, stalk people in their tracks and correct them over stuff like that. I mean, goodness gracious, really? You're going to go give heaven some hell? And I love country music too, but when you start crossing into... That's why I said years ago, don't get you Jesus from a country song. You get you Jesus from the Word of God. Stood up at a funeral and had to preach after that song was played one time. Broke my heart. Like, what am I supposed to do now? You know? <laughs> Y'all called me here to preach the gospel, and you're up there con contrary to the gospel. And he also speaks of something very important in closing here. Their perseverance and faith during persecution. When you go to somebody and say what I just said, guess what you're fixing to get? Persecution. Well, who are you? I got my Jesus. You like that lady that's running for state representative here in our community. Well, me and you are going to different heavens. Thank God me and you are going to different heavens. And we got people in our community that vote for that. Because she's standing on the opposite of what God told us to, to stand on. See, these are reasons, this is why the church has got to speak up. you got to. you got to give them the truth. And when you do that, their persecution. He said that their perseverance and faith is during this persecution. And I want you to know something, church. If you're on the, if you're on the fence here this morning, listen to me. Persecution will always make the fake Christian leave. When the trials come in your life, when the persecution comes in your life, when people don't like you and they're saying bad things about you and they don't want whatever comes in your life, you will leave if you don't truly know Christ. But when you truly know Christ, it's like he says in 1 John, they went out from us because they were not of us. But they remained, why? Because they were of us. If they had been of us, they would have remained. You won't leave. When you realize, and here's how you do this, when you realize that this world is not your home and you long to be with Jesus more than you do in this world, then I promise you something. You can endure far more than you think you can endure in this vapor of a life. Why? Because your eyes are focused on heaven. You'll be just like Job. Even though you slay me, Lord, I'll still serve you. This world ain't got nothing for you. Nothing for you. Pray. Father, thank you for this little letter to the church. 
Lord, there's so much that you pack in each verse. I pray your church sees it. But Father, I think that one of the most important things I've seen today is, is uh, that we each of us learn what it means to have an unconditional love. Father, people are not going to meet all of our expectations. People are going to mess up. People are going to make mistakes. People are going to say things they shouldn't have said. People are going to be ignorant of the Word of God. We talked about it last week. There's going to be people that we could find ourselves beginning to hate like they hated Matthew, the tax collector. But Lord, you didn't put hate in us. You put love in us. Father, I pray that your church would walk away today with a desire to love people. That they would see the love of the church, the unconditional love of the church, and they would desire to be with us. Because knowing that being with us is going to help them grow in their faith because we preach the Word of God. We stand on the Word of God. You tell us in your Bible that the church is the pillar and ground of all truth. We are the truth because we preach the Bible. It is absolute truth. So Father, I pray that the church walks away today strengthened, that we walk away today uh, answering the convictions in our heart. Maybe we're not serving where we should be serving. Maybe we're not people that, that you would write to and you say you're proud of their the way that they are. You're proud of their faith and you're proud of their love towards. Maybe somebody in here is thinking, you know what? I don't have strong faith and I don't have love for the church. Father, I pray today would be the day that you change that for them. Father, I pray today would be the day that as we leave here that we do care what the community thinks about us. We care what the church thinks about us. Our life is not our own. Father, we all want to be the best vessels for you that we can be in this vapor of a life you've given. So, Father, forgive us all where we fail you. Strengthen us. Give us wisdom and discernment where we need it. Father, I also want to pray as I do every week, if there's someone here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior of their life, right now, right now, Father, they would answer that call. You would draw them to you and save their soul. You would give them a new heart. Father, I pray that they would stand up, come forward and let the church know, I do believe in Jesus Christ. I do believe He is God incarnate in the flesh and that He came to take my sin. And I do believe that He died on the cross, that He made the atonement for my sin. He is the only way. I do believe that He was buried and that He rose again. And Father, I pray that they would boldly say, I will serve Him all the days of my life. Today is the day of salvation. Father, please don't let anyone leave this room today that doesn't belong to you. I pray that you would born them again by your grace. And I pray all of these things in Jesus' name.